Welcome back, everybody. I'm here with Brian Jarrett today. And by here, I mean we are talking on Zoom. Um, Brian's in Gallup, and I'm in Phoenix right now. And we're in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemic. So Brian, you want to introduce yourself and uh, tell us how you ended up in, in Gallup? Yeah, uh, thanks for having me on, Derek. It's great to chat. Uh, so my name is Brian Jarrett. I'm an emergency medicine physician who trained actually in Brooklyn and then did a wilderness medicine fellowship in, out of Mass General Hospital in Boston. And uh, you and I actually met uh, while I was working as a, a physician on a multi-day ultra endurance race in the Southwest, right? Uh, so I do a mix of part-time emergency medicine work in multiple hospitals around the country. And currently I'm focusing uh, essentially entirely on Native American hospitals within the Indian Health Service. So the Indian Health Service is this uh, uh, is the health system that provides healthcare to Native Americans, kind of similar to the VA for veterans. And I work in Gallup, New Mexico, in Hopi, Arizona, on the Hopi Reservation. And I also work at Alaska Native Medical Center up in Anchorage, Alaska. Cool. Um, so how'd you end up there in Gallup? Because Gallup obviously is a long way from Boston, and I know you, you travel quite a bit. But why and how are you there? Yeah, so I wanted to have a version of practicing in emergency medicine that provided me with enough flexibility to both do wilderness medicine things, like spend uh, some periods of time doing working as a physician up on up in mountain base camps. So I worked in Nepal last year uh, up in the high altitude uh, in a high altitude clinic there, and also so do those wilderness medicine activities, but also work in an area of the country. I'm sure it's beautiful and the Southwest is incredibly beautiful. Alaska is incredibly beautiful. And uh, kind of most importantly, if I am going to be doing uh, emergency medicine work, I want to do it in a place that's meaningful for me and needs my expertise. And so a lot of the um, emergency rooms in on Indian reservations and Native American reservations are, um, are understaffed or are staffed with providers that are not trained in emergency medicine. So I wanted to come and try to do my best to help out. Awesome. So why, I guess, to get, I don't know, go to basics, I guess. So like they're understaffed, but why are they so understaffed? Is that like a government issue? Is it a, a private thing or, or what's going on with that? So obviously it varies by community, but these are all remote locations and it's just difficult to find uh, physicians that want to go and live in these remote places. So, yeah, I think that's, that's a factor of it. Yeah. Okay. So I guess we should backtrack a little bit. So with the whole like coronavirus, COVID-19 and everything, like people know that like obviously living in a dense population, you're going to, it's easier to get sick. Like you go to LA, you go to New York, San Francisco, or even on a bigger level, like Mexico city or almost any city in China, like they're massive places, huge population density. And it's even from a very basic knowledge of, of medicine and disease, like, you know, it's easy to transmit things that way. So yeah, you can kind of, that's easy to understand, right? It's like easy to understand when you have, you know, a million people in two city blocks that, yeah, it's an exaggeration, yeah. but <laughs> yeah, I have a medical background and it's like, duh, and I think most people would get that. But like, lately though, like, besides all the other stuff in, in dense cities, like, I've been seeing a lot of stuff pop up about like Navajo Nation, the, Ho the Hopi Nation, and, and other um, Native American reservations where like the COVID-19 virus is so rampant. And do you want to talk a little bit about that and like, why? Because it doesn't really make sense to me because you just explained about how sparse and, and remote a lot of these places are, yet it's, it's just going crazy out there. Yeah, so I think it's interesting, or it's, it's important to give, give some context. And I guess I'll start with the full disclosure that I am not an epidemiologist. I um, emergency medicine physician who works in these in some in some of these hospitals so I can really only comment a lot about what I've seen in Gallup and what I've heard about in some of the other small hospitals that some colleagues work in uh, so I just wanted to just give that as a caveat because there's a lot of people um, 
that are talking about a lot of things that they aren't incredibly aware of. So I want to just say that this is my experience, what I've experienced here in Gallup and why I think that it's become incredibly prevalent here. So one of the first things to really mention is that when we talk about these outbreaks having a really big impact, it, it's really important to think about whether you're talking about sheer number of people so how many number of people are getting infected or whether you're talking about that as number of people per population. Okay. So if you just look at our absolute numbers of infection, they're not incredibly high, right? There's less than a thousand people on, um, in our county that have been infected, right? So it's not an incredibly high number of confirmed cases compared to the you know tens of thousands that are infected in New York. But when you compare it to the population of this area, obviously it's sparse and it's spread out, we are actually third most prevalent behind New York and New Jersey in the entire country when you look at it per population uh, on the Navajo Reservation as a whole. Okay. So when you talk about why, Jack, I think that's what you're trying to get at is why I think that that has happened. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's difficult to say. There's probably a lot of factors that uh, I'm not aware of, but the things that I have noticed from seeing these patients on a daily basis and talking about their living situations and talking about who they're in contact with and things like that, I think there's, there's three major things, and they all center around one large underlying issue that's been an issue on the Navajo Reservation for a long time, which is low incomes and, and poverty, which is, uh, and lack of resources that is in stark contrast to much of the United States. So one of the most interesting articles I read was a survey from, when I first started working on the reservation, was a survey from Stanford that just went around and did a, a resource survey of people on the Navajo reservation. And they showed that 40% of people on the Navajo reservation ha don't have access to either running water or electricity. Okay. So, so how would that affect people then because it's like the virus obviously isn't being transmitted like whatever like with running water and electricity so like totally right yeah how does that play into the whole like pandemic yeah so i think that that is an indicator for everything else that's going on right so that's an indicator of just the kind of level of lack of resources and poverty that exists in this community so what that has resulted in is it results in people that live in many people to one location. So you're having multi-generational, and you also have multi-generational homes, which is unlike a lot of other places in the US, right? So like people live with their elders. So it's grandparents living with their children and living with their grandkids because they all have grown up in the same area and they don't necessarily leave and migrate the same way that a lot of the rest of the US population has and like moving away from their parents out and living somewhere else in the country. So there's multi-generational homes that have a lot of people in them. And so it's really hard to socially distance within your home. And then if you don't have running water, there's a lot of stories about people that don't have running water or electricity. It's really difficult to socially isolate from the people around you because you have to drive somewhere to get water. And if you don't have electricity, that means you don't have a refrigerator, which means you can't go to the grocery store and buy a week or two weeks worth of food and save it. And also, if you don't have money or resources, then you can't afford to go to the grocery store and spend $200 for food in one swoop, right? That's like your entire month's income. So, huh. so how I think all those things... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think all those things play a role. And then whenever we see uh, poverty in an area, we know that poverty leads to uh, substance abuse. And alcoholism is a huge pro uh, problem on the reservation. So that also contributes uh, to, the, to these cases because we, in order to try to create a safe environment for uh, the large number of uh, people who have uh, problems with alcohol on the reservation, we've created shelter systems for them uh, for when they're intoxicated and unable to like safely get home or get around so they don't like, you know, 
pass out on the street or get hit by a car or things like that. So we've created a really, really good shelter system for them. But the problem with that is that that shelter system is a community shelter system. And so we uh, had some cases of coronavirus that occurred in that community shelter system. And then that contributed to spreading it to um, a good bit of the community otherwise. So, okay. So I guess if we, if we backtrack a bit and correct me if I'm wrong here, um, it seems like a lot of the issues arise just from poor health in general. Am I, am I wrong on that? Yeah, so that's, yeah. So I don't think that the baseline poor health status of the native American population contributes to the incidence. So the incidence is how many cases we're having. I think that the sheer number of cases that we're seeing and the spread of those cases is more due to the kind of systemic um, uh, poverty and lack of resources that exist in this area. But the, and this has been shown in multiple previous epidemics that have gone through the Native American population, is that consistently the mortality for these infectious diseases is significantly higher in in the Native American population. So what we are seeing is that despite there being not that many cases compared in sheer number compared to some other areas, we are seeing a lot of sick people because there is an, a higher incidence of all these uh, other comorbidities or other medical problems. So things like high blood pressure and diabetes and kidney problems are all more prevalent in Native Americans. So those increase your risk for having bad outcomes when you do get the coronavirus. So it's kind of double-edged sword. You're more likely to get it because you're living with, you know, 15 other people in a trailer without running water. And then if you're, because you're a Native American and you probably don't have as good of baseline health in general, then you're more likely to get sick when you do get it. Well, it sounds almost like a perfect storm. It's like poor health. Yeah, I mean, uh, together and yeah. Huh. It's one of the reasons why the Native Americans have had have been devastated by epidemics in the past. So yeah, let's talk a little more about that because before we started recording, we were talking about um, other epidemics and like SARS and these other viruses. Um, and we talked specifically about the flu of 1918, um, and you said it killed what 3,000 Native American or Na Navajos, I should say, which was 24 percent of the population at the time. Yeah, so I, I looked this up in two different places. Somewhere between two and three thousand uh, Navajo died in the 1918 pandemic, and that was a quarter, essentially a quarter of their population, somewhere around that. So, and I uh, also read that in the in a previous flu epidemic to that, that up to eighty percent of some of these small communities uh, had had been totally wiped out by previous pandemics. So. It really, it has the potential to really heavily impact this population. Huh. So, like, what about, like, like SARS and, like, swine flu, mad cow, like, all those other things? Is like, it seems like they were, yeah, like, people were, like, frustrated with it. It was, like, a kind of scary thing, but it seemed to pass so quickly, um, at least, like, in the media world, but, like, with COVID-19, it seems like it's nonstop. Like, that's all anybody talks about. Like, um, just a little backstory. Like, I was in New Zealand on a, a film shoot for like a month when this all started. Yeah, just before this, I remember seeing your pictures. It looked awesome. Yeah, it was, it was rad, and I was really lucky to be there. But it was interesting, like, we would, like, I don't know, people would talk to us, like, oh, hey, like, you're from America. Like, like coronavirus, we're like, what are you talking about? Like. Yeah, like we had <laughs> about it or we had like maybe like walk through a lobby somewhere and you would see something on the news about it or you go to the airport and like there's signs and whatever. It's like, oh, if you're sick or whatever, like let us know. But like, it didn't seem real until I flew into LAX. And when I flew into LAX, it was like, it was weird. Like it was, it was quiet and like people were like hush, hush talking about coronavirus. And then all the news channels, like that's all they were talking about. And for me, it felt very different than like when, when SARS came about and like Mad Cow and what I, I don't know, swine flu and all these other things. So like, why is coronavirus getting so much more attention 
at least in the mainstream media, do you think? I know you're not necessarily an expert on this particular subject, but like, what, what's kind of your uh, opinion about that? I mean, I do have some thoughts about it for sure. So I think one thing that's, and I'll tell you another kind of anecdote from some friends that I have to live in Singapore. Uh, so uh, I think one of the major things is that SARS didn't really get to the US the way coronavirus has, right? SARS affected a lot of the Pacific and, and Asia and South Pacific, and they very much remember the SARS outbreak. When I talk to my friends who live in Singapore, they were, they basically, they described the response and obviously Singapore is a very different country than the United States and they have a very different authoritarian <laughs> uh, kind of uh, government there that can impose a lot of restrictions and does impose a lot, of, a lot of restrictions. But they said that they were so prepared for something like this because they had gone through the SARS epidemic and they knew that what they needed to do was ramp up testing and do contract tracing. So like if somebody tests positive, they find out every person that they were in contact with and they go and track them down and quarantine them. And again, a little bit of that has to do with the ability of an authoritarian, a more authoritarian regimen, uh, regime rather. And uh, uh, some of it is just that it affected the, the Asia Pacific area a lot more than it affected us. Um, as far as why coronavirus is a much bigger deal, it's because it kind of has the perfect storm to make a pandemic. So when you talk about like the SARS and the MERS and things like that, the reasons they didn't become as big were because they, so for MERS, for example, MERS was in, is incredibly deadly. It kills like a quarter, a quarter of the people. So 25% of people, 20 to 25% of people that get it die from MERS, right? But that means that the virus doesn't have a chance to spread because it kills a quarter of the people that it infects. <laughs> Yeah, And with SARS, one of the major things was that you became symptomatic relatively quickly and you were infectious only while you were symptomatic. And so those two things are not present in the coronavirus. So the coronavirus takes a week to manifest symptoms. And then even then there's uh, some uh, studies emerging, some data emerging that show that you are expressing some viral load up to two days before you are showing symptoms. So you're having asymptomatic transmission, which is what's been talked about a lot, uh, I think, in the media. This idea that people are infected and don't know they're infected and are spreading that disease, right? And then it takes another week for you to get sick and to, for you to get really sick after you start having symptoms. And the two other major factors is that, yeah, the mortality rate isn't that high, but it's probably at a minimum 10 times the mortality rate of the flu, but up to 15 or 20% of the people are requiring hospital admission and critical care. So it's just in totally overwhelming our hospital system and causing that hospital system to not work as well and not work as well for all the other diseases that have always existed. So I, I guess you kind of saying that like the worst, no, I shouldn't say the worst part, but like one of the most damaging aspects or the most deadly aspects of the coronavirus is just the fact that it just takes up hospital beds in, in an understaffed area particularly. So I think that the re I would say that the worst aspect of the coronavirus is that the vast majority of people just get a cold. <laughs> I think that that's because like how many colds are happening right now, right? Like how many, like whatever, you have a little sniffles and you just are like, oh, I'm used to having sniffles and going to work. Uh -huh. And that's causing this virus to spread much more rapidly and widely than it would. And if when it's spreading widely and rapidly and you have 20% of people, 15, 20% of people requiring hospital mission our hospitals are just not prepared for that kind of influx and so there's two things there like yeah the hospital systems are totally getting overwhelmed like our hospital in Gallup particularly is seeing a marked increase in the number of people that we're seeing with these respiratory complaints and it is consuming even though we've essentially opened up a whole separate area of our hospital just to deal 
with respiratory cases and there's two whole wings that are inpatient wings and we tried to expand our beds and we've really been working hard to expand our inpatient bed capacity. There's still only so many hospital beds and there's only six intensive care unit beds and there's just not enough for 20% of the Navajo population to come to the hospital. It just doesn't, there's just not enough beds. Yeah, and that makes sense. So, like, what sort of things can people be doing then to help? Like, I'm assuming one is just don't go to the Indian Reservation right now, right? Yeah, I mean, there, as far as, like, if you live outside of the reservation and you're trying to, trying to help out, yeah, try not to, like, drive through and go to a bunch of shops and stores and stop at a bunch of places, especially if you're symptomatic, obviously. I mean, you shouldn't be going out of your house if you're symptomatic. Uh, but there's also a bunch of different ways that you can uh, donate to support uh, the Navajo Nation. And I can try to look some of those up and, and send some to you as far as like supporting, uh, getting access to food and uh, um, getting access to um different hospital services and funding like helping to to fund public health initiatives uh here on the Navajo reservation okay so i guess with that said like is there really any like maybe it's not the right way to say it, but like light at the end of the tunnel like do you see things improving at all or is it just right now just kind of like oh man we're working a ton and this is awful like is there any any hope i guess I mean, there's always hope. And one of the great things we, and this has kind of been like a little bit of a downer of a discussion, right? Cause like, man, coronavirus is brutal and it's really affecting people. But one of the amazing things and one of the reasons why I was drawn to this population is that the Navajo are incredibly, and the Hopi population and the Native Americans in general are just incredible people, right? The, I'm sure that you've witnessed this, you mentioned this, but when we were talking before we started uh, about just being really impressed with the people on the reservation and how, how incredibly inspiring they are, right? So I think that they're, the, the biggest hope is that, you know, these people are incredibly supportive of each other and incredibly loving and they will, they and their culture will make it through this pandemic. Uh, and hopefully maybe this will shine some light on uh, across the country about the fact that we need better preventative care and better kind of basic support for healthcare in general. Like we don't need necessarily more intensive care unit beds, but if we as a population were a healthier population, then it wouldn't affect us as much. So maybe that will transfer into uh, some investment or some focus on improving the overall uh, socioeconomic and, and health uh, status of the Native American population. That would be kind of one of my hopes. And if we're looking for like, you know, long term, once we, once this is getting better, but uh, right now we're still ramping up. So New York is showing signs of plateauing, but on the Navajo reservation, we are probably a few weeks behind them. And we are just starting to see this week really uh, at least in Gallup, this week has been the massive influx of sicker people with coronavirus. Okay. So I guess another question, this is kind of related to what you were just talking about, kind of not, but like what are the economic impacts? And I know a lot of people, if you talk about the economy and money when, you know, in the middle of a pandemic, they're like, oh, like that's all you care about is making money and blah, blah, blah. But we, we know that like if you don't have a job and you're out of work for a long time, obviously there's a lot of issues that come and stem from that. So like, like what are the economic impacts right now? Do you feel like, I know you're not an economist by any means, but like, do you see that happening? Like people like losing their jobs or being furloughed or just in general, like a little bit of despair from like a broken economy now? Yes, yeah, so I guess. Uh... Again, I'll qualify my response to this. It's based on kind of a series of anecdotes of me seeing a bunch of these patients and talking to them a lot about their living situation and their working situation because those are major risk factors for spreading this virus. So I try to ask those things when I talk when I see them when they come to the hospital. So it's just I'm 
speaking about this from that subset of people that I've been talking to. But <laughs> ironically, it doesn't seem like the financial impacts are really all that big because a lot of people didn't really have much work to do on the reservation in the first place. And the work that they, the jobs that they do have are essentially all essential jobs. So they're working in grocery stores or food places or uh, working in hospitals. And uh, the other, the other jobs that people have are, are trades, right? So a lot of people are, you know, welders or, farmers or raise livestock or something like that. And they're not particularly being affected by, by this, at least right now that I can tell when I, when I talk to people, but I haven't been specifically asking them uh, in their, in the middle of their emergency medicine evaluation, whether they're being uh, impacted economically. I know that the casino is being closed. It is definitely having an impact on kind of the subset of the community that gets income from that, but I haven't, Certainly the, the Navajo uh, Nation has a very low emphasis right now on, on getting people back to work. <laughs> that, is, that is by far not the priority of the Navajo Nation to the point where the Navajo Nation has instituted weekend curfews. I don't know if you've heard about this. Um, Tell me more about it. Yeah, so it's one of the, there's been a, a huge amount of steps for, and I guess this is kind of another aspect of, of the hopefulness is the uh, IHS as a whole and specifically Gallup and the Navajo Nation has been doing a whole lot to try to curb the impact of this on its population. So there's been, uh, you know, Navajo language public service announcements on the radio, um, they have a weekend curfew for the past two weekends, maybe three, but definitely the past two weekends. If you are on the reservation, you are not allowed to leave from Friday night till Monday morning. You're not allowed to go out of your house and they have police patrolling and ticketing people if they're out of their house for any not essential purpose. Uh, so they've been received fairly well. Cause like, obviously like there's places around other parts of the U S where people are hundred percent boycotting that. But is it a kind of like a microcosm there on the reservations? I mean, this is one of the the beauties of of the Navajo people is that they're like, okay, our our elders and our community are telling us that this is the best thing to do. This is what we're gonna do. So they they are at least as a community, I see a lot of unity in that, and I see very little uh, rebellion from that. There are some subsets uh, of people that I think are not doing as good of a job, at least from what I've seen of isolating as, as others are. And I think that's, at least from what I've heard, similar to around the country, it's, you know, young people that don't have the same kind of concepts of, uh, of consequences, I guess. Right. Um, They, they probably won't get that sick, but you know, this is, this is not the time to, to visit grandma you know, a few times a week, you know? (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So, so. but then again, if you're, you know, 80 year old grandmother lives alone, somebody has got to bring her food and check on her. So, uh, and and she lives alone with no, oh, this is one of the other things that I didn't really talk about. A lot of people don't have access to cell phones, right? So there's like one cell phone per family. Mm -hmm. So in the rest of the world, people are like, oh, or at least in in a lot of the other places in the US, like certainly, friends of mine they're like oh this isn't you know it's bad it's rough but like I can zoom conference with my family or you know grandparents and check in on them and make sure they're doing okay and that kind of stuff and like that's just totally on a on the opposite spectrum to like the 80 some year old couple that lives remote in a remote location and doesn't have a cell phone so like how do you do you just like think that they're okay no you're gonna go like their family is loves them and wants to go check on them and it's just all these things that, that are contributing, I think, to, to the challenges of dealing with a pandemic like this and in this location. Really interesting. Like it's, it's so multifaceted. And I think like a lot of people that have never even spent any time or much time on reservations don't understand how they work. And like I myself, yeah, I, I spent time on the drive through, but I'm by no means an expert. I'm never going to claim that. But it's a very different world and like how things operate is very different than like say like Flagstaff and like Tuba City area or something. 
Yeah, totally. I mean, I'm with you. I, I wish that I actually could spend a little more time out with the people and learning a little bit more about their actual lifestyle. But this has been a really interesting uh, version of learning that because I am asking a lot of people about their lifestyle and who they live with and, um, and what their living situation is because it's, I think it's relevant to, to ask people when you're, when they come in and this is what's going on. I, and I try to do my best. One of the other things that I didn't mention that's been amazing since this outbreak started that as far as our response to this is they have shut down that kind of group uh, shelter and the New Mexico Department of Health has rented out essentially three whole hotels in Gallup and we are housing all of our un, undomiciled or homeless population, um, our high-risk uh, alcoholics are, are being housed essentially and it's kind of amazing to me at least to see that here and one of my colleagues talked about them doing it doing that in texas so i think in dallas somewhere it's like is this what it is going to take for um america to realize that like having people live on the streets or you know allowing uh conditions that further people's substance abuse to to exist um I would hope that maybe this would be a wake up call for that to, for us to say as a society that maybe we can do something to try to try to help prevent that from happening. Yeah, that, that's a good point. I think there's a lot of like doom and gloom, like, you know, on social media, especially people that are quarantined at home or just on social all day. And it's just nonstop negativity. It's like so-and-so said this or blah, 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 <laughs> whatever. Yeah. But yeah. I brutal. Think, even though it is an awful situation, like don't get me wrong on this. I think there are positives that can come from it. Like if we learn from it properly, um, we can apply these things in the future and maybe we won't have a pandemic like this again. Like maybe we will, but maybe we won't if we apply what we've learned from this and be smart about it. Oh yeah. I mean, just as a, as a human who also consumes news and uh, is a person, I think I, I would like to think that we're going to learn a lot and that, this is going to be a time period that we're going to remember for a long time. We're going to talk to our kids about the coronavirus pandemic of 2019 and 2020. You know, it's going to, it's going to stick with us. I hope at least it should, right. It's like, this is a, this is a major event and you know, people losing their jobs is, is really, really terrible. Um, but people losing their lives is also really sad. Yeah. And I feel like they kind of go hand in hand as well too. It's like, yeah, you want to be safe like, and healthy, but at the same time, it's like, well, you can't just not work forever. So there has to be some sort of compromise, right? Like work in a safe way and like follow these protocols. So that way we can still survive. Like, like, if, I don't know, like you, have to, you have to live, right? Totally. Yeah. And the, the way that other countries who have been successful at trying to contain this have done it is with the things that were outlined by, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of opinions about what's going on in the government and policies and all that kind of stuff. But the the written, at least, or the the written guidelines that I read about uh, that were put out by um, the CDC and uh, the federal administration, the return guidelines seem very reasonable to me. It's just a matter of whether we're actually going to execute those. So like, can you test everyone who has symptoms? Can you contact trace all of those? So like when we say contract tracing, we mean like, all right, you have a person who has symptoms. You need to find out every person that person was in contact with for the past seven days, essentially to make sure that all of those people come in and get tested and that all those people quarantine. And are we willing to do that as Americans to have the resources to do that? And also to stay, if we're told that we need to be quarantined to do that. And so, yeah, I think that it's totally reasonable that we could, that we can return to kind of um, some sense of normalcy if we have that ability, right? If we have the ability to limit these outbreaks when they happen. Yeah, because they're going to they're going to continue to happen. Yeah, for sure. Like it's not like we're never going to have an outbreak of a virus again, right? It's like it's going to happen at some point. But um, yeah, I guess at some point. Yeah, totally. I mean, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that there was just an article today about how the fact that like 
oh, one fifth of New York got infected, right? Well, that's what happens when 20% of your population gets infected. The idea that people, that you're gonna get herd immunity from having 80% of the people be infected with this and then people are gonna be immune after that, uh, I think that, that that's dangerous. The idea that you're just gonna let everybody get infected and then it'll be fine and then we'll recover, that is not a, that is not a medically sound uh, solution, which is why it wasn't the, uh, <laughs> which is why the coronavirus task force did not suggest that we just open everything up and ha let everybody get infected, right? <laughs> that wasn't the solution. Yeah, how does that work? Like, like, okay, so say, and with other things, we build up antibodies, right? So prevent yourself from getting sick from like say the flu or a cold or whatever. Is it different with coronavirus or how does that work? Yes, we don't know for sure whether people can get reinfected, but there is a pretty good indication that uh, a good number of people that get the virus have antibodies afterwards, which will presumably prevent you from getting the same exact strain of that virus again. Uh, it's the whole concept of vaccination. So the there are two ways that you can create a society that is immune to a virus. You can either vaccinate 85 to 90% of people. So you give them a small piece of the virus or there's a bunch of different ways to do vaccines, but in general, you give them like a small piece of the inactivated or dead virus and their body gets exposed to that, learns what, that that's a foreign kind of uh, pathogen and it creates antibodies, which are these little proteins that can detect that virus and kill it. And as long as you have 80 to 90, 90, usually 80 to 90% of people that have those antibodies, then you, then you won't have outbreaks of these diseases. So that's what we've done with pretty much every other major deadly virus that we've had before that's, that would cause something like this. So like things like measles or mumps or polio. Uh, so that's what you have vaccines for, right? That's what you get vaccines for uh, is to keep those from, from spreading like, like wildfire. And you could do that with natural immunity as well. So, uh, if we wanted to, if we didn't have a vaccine, for example, for measles, then yeah, sure, we could let 80 to 90% of people get measles, and then we wouldn't have any more outbreaks of it, but we would also lose a significant portion of the human population because measles would kill a bunch of them. So that's kind of the idea behind coronavirus is that until we have a vaccine for it, the idea of having herd immunity, so the, herd, the idea of herd immunity is that enough people have immunity to the virus that if, say, like a person in a community got it, that it wouldn't spread rapidly to the rest of the community because you could just put that person away and then other people would have immunity to it. That's just not a realistic solution right now. Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess kind of looking back at history, is it in once again, correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm no expert on this. Um, is that kind of the same thing like when Europeans came to the Americas and wiped out a huge uh, portion of the native population? Is, is that the same sort of thing? Smallpox, yeah. I mean, that's basically what smallpox did to the Native Americans. Yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I um, think it makes sense then and like helps kind of clarify it for people that like... Yeah, because Europeans had some immunity to smallpox because they it had already decimated made it the European population, right? So, so Europe didn't just not get smallpox, they decimated their population, but then the people that were immune recovered and they had enough people who are immune, but then the Native American population had never been exposed to it before. Interesting. So, so we are all, we are all Native Americans with respect to this virus. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't know that, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, it's been, it's been certainly an adventure seeing this like, so I have a bunch of colleagues cause I did my residency training, my emergency medicine training in New York and I've been talking to them and I heard all of their really, really um, difficult stories that they were having of just being totally overwhelmed there. And at that time I felt really bad about not being able to go in New York, go to New York and help out. And, but Gallup New 
needed me to work here because I had agreed to work shifts here. And then we kind of started to get prepared here uh, at Gallup Indian Medical Center where I work. And we have, we've become, we've been very, very supported by our hospital administration and our emergency medicine administration. And we have enough PPE and we've been very proactive. We have, we set up respiratory, we set up like tents to triage people outside long before this virus was uh, highly prevalent. And we've been setting up systems for, you know, dealing with sicker patients and ways to make that safe for providers. So it's, it's been really inspiring to see both our medical community and Navajo Foundation as a whole and uh, New Mexico as a state uh, kind of come together. They sent the National Guard here two weeks ago. They've been working on putting up a field hospital, essentially. Um, so there's a lot of movement that's happening. Um, like I said, these hotel rooms that we're renting out. Um, yeah, it's been really, really incredible to see when people come together and uh, everybody has kind of the common interests at heart. It's cool. It's cool to see, and the eight billion dollars that was set a, set aside in the in the federal legislature just for the IHS, right? There was a bunch of funding that gets sent, sent out to a bunch of people, and part of that was sent to the IHS. Cool. I think it's interesting what you're saying that like if people work together on something and like put politics aside and like all of our differences, like how much you can actually accomplish for the greater good of everybody. Yeah, this is this whole experience has been has been showing a lot of colors of humanity. And what I tend to try to focus on, I guess maybe that's just my perspective in life is that for me, I've seen a lot of amazing people do a lot of amazing things. So it's been it's been simultaneously inspiring. And also, you know, it's sad to sad to see people and their family members. And I've had personal connections of mine that have already passed away from this virus back in New York. So it's really unfortunate. Yeah, definitely. Um, well, cool, man. Um, it's kind of positive, but also a lot of bad stuff going on, but I guess we knew that was going to be kind of the topic of the, the podcast today. So um, thanks for talking to us for a bit. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hope people learned a, a little bit bit and uh yeah i i would encourage you to just uh educate yourself about the native american population i'm i continue to learn things that i didn't know before about the the amazing people that live out here and they're resilient people and they live on and hopefully we can do what we can to try to help them do that yeah definitely well thanks for all you're doing out there and, and keep it up and let me know if you need anything Awesome. It was really nice to talk to you, Derek. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. Um, talk to you soon. Yep. See you, bud. Yep. Have a good one. Have a good night. You too.